Um, so I've got my foot in two spaces, mentally and emotionally, and from a research end. And by having my foot in two spaces, I'm going to give you a confusing talk today. And hopefully you'll try and get at what I mean by this uh, state of confusion. And, and secondly, I also hope that people will stop inviting me to do talks after that, because you'll realize it's kind of shit. So here are the topics that I'd like to address. Um, I'm going to talk about a few factors that I think are relevant, and the main thing I really want to talk about is the final point. Uh, the rest of it's kind of fluff, so if you've got email and Twitter and stuff to do, uh, wait until that fifth section comes up and then you can dive in. So it's a little bit of context. I don't think this is new for many of you. You spend a lot of time in education hearing interesting narratives around what's happening and what we're becoming. And a lot of that narrative is blatant nonsense. But it's still a dominant narrative. It's being picked up by media. And I'll talk about that a little bit because there's a power dimension that underpins it. And this power dimension gives the impression that there is something great and substantive happening. And I'm increasingly thinking there is something damaging and negative happening. And so I'm going to try and unpack that or just say random things about it. So here's a bit of the narrative. So one, this is a reality. The labor markets are fluctuating dramatically. What it means to be an employee now in every sector of society has changed. It's no longer the view of, I get a degree, I work for life, and so on. So it's advanced economies, emerging economies, like China as well, uh, at this stage have less than 50% of their working labor population involved in what was traditionally viewed as production jobs. The vast majority of work today is in non-production-oriented works. That could be service or knowledge-related work. Another aspect that's interesting, it kind of captures it visually, for me at least, but this is an image of the US in the 1990s, and this is the, the prominent states in terms of the primary employers. And so the blue states are the ones that have manufacturing. And this isn't that long ago, right? Like some of you were in nightclubs taking your first beverages when this was happening. And so uh, that was it. So the vast majority of states manufacturing. Now you look forward even just two years ago. This is healthcare now as the primary em uh, employer is what you see in orange. So in a span of not a hell of a lot of time, 25 years, a little less, we've seen the labor market essentially flip in the times of employment. And that has enormous implications for learning within a society. You take and you look at employment by industry. In this case, I'm looking at uh, the Australian sector, uh, sector, I should say, and you're seeing that manufacturing, agriculture continue to decline and decline, whereas services and related knowledge industries continue to increase. So that means, point one, if you're not getting an education, you're screwed in today's economy. It's literally that simple. If you're from a lower socioeconomic status and you do not have access to a quality education, enjoy a life of poverty. It's essentially what we're saying. And Truman articulated this in 1947 already. So when you have a context where the only way to advance in a society is to get an education, but you have a reality that says to access that education, you have to really be from a certain socioeconomic stratus within society. So what ends up happening, instead of being the enabler for a better life, education that is inaccessible and unattainable to learners is actually a condemnation to the current existence. So there's some significant thinking that we have to do about this reality. We need education to get a job, and yet we're not providing the infrastructure that allows broad access to education. I'm sure you've seen some reports that address this. Since 1960s, if you're in the lower quartile in the US in terms of income, you've actually seen a slight diminishment in your access to higher education, or at least a stabilization. It depends on which year you look at the data. In contrast, if you're from the upper socioeconomic status within a society, you've moved from something like 60% higher education attainment to approaching 90 plus percent. So there has been a dramatic shift. If you're rich, you're going to have a pretty good life going forward. Now, this isn't just something that's happening in the labor market in general, in some of these transitions and some of the impact that has on lower socioeconomic status. Higher education, which in theory should be the space where we function according to higher ideals and where we consider things that are consequential and important, we're not acting that way. In fact, we're starting to see enormous growth in uh, a just-in-time labor force that has PhDs living in essentially near a poverty line because we are misplacing our values and what education ought to be and the role that it ought to play in society. That's reflected here in terms of the enormous increase, the top line in terms of adjunct or related faculty, uh, whereas tenure track employment continues to decline. And this isn't new to anybody. You see this in the news, so all of you are aware of this. 
Put it in another context, 40 plus percent of jobs in the US now fit into something that's called contingent jobs. These are non-traditional jobs where things like security are at stake and the individual lives for, not to be over dramatic or anything, but lives a life of quiet desperation, hoping that things will change, but in reality, essentially being confined by the social structures we've created as a society. So that's your happy thought for the day. Um, now, just to make things go even better, so let's just say that this is our reality today. We've got this tremendous opportunity to learn and to grow. We've got MOOCs happening over here. We've got whatever else going on. But don't worry, if you get an education, it won't matter because the robots are taking our jobs. And there's, uh, in some statements, because there's always hype to look at here, but in excess of 50% of current jobs are going to be within the next decade to 15 years, depending who you talk to, automated. And by automation, this already fragile workforce that has clinging very narrowly to a quality of life is going to be further disrupted by the growing influence of automation. And just in case you're interested, you can look at how long until you are unemployed um, at the court site. So we have this, we have, I would say, collective societal angst around our relationship to labor, job market, and so on. And if anything, this is becoming more and more pronounced. And as we're advancing as a society, this was mentioned in some of the opening statements, we are advancing and moving faster and faster, and yet we're killing our humanity in the process, just to understate it. So let's turn to MOOCs, because uh, MOOCs can solve all of those things. And then we'll all be happy, and we're going to marry beautiful people and have beautiful little babies and have goat farms. So the MOOC narrative, here's sort of how it started. So open education, I'm glad that was mentioned in some of the opening address here, but open education has a long trajectory. I and mean, it goes back to the 60s with the development of the open university. It goes back even further when you first had uh, distance education as a means of you know, instruction through telegraph and so on. So it's about 150 plus year endeavor to instruct at a distance. You could argue as well that quite possibly uh, religious texts are also an example of distance education that occurred way before we got to where we are. But anyway, so we've got open education, a lot of movement and activity happening, open university, MIT, learning management systems, and so on. Then in 2008, which I'll talk about in a little bit, we started with a series of MOOCs, which we called Connectivist MOOCs, because the best way to succeed as an academic is to take two vague, buzzwordy terms, put them together, and it's a legitimate thing. And so, and the, but over time, and, and you know this narrative, when Stanford came along, started running MOOCs, so on and so on, and that's where we ended up where we are today, and I'll get on this in a bit. So we ran a MOOC in 2008 with Stephen Downs, um, he, he's, if you don't subscribe to his OL Daily newsletter, uh, he continually provides insults for me, and I appreciate that. But uh, if you want to be on top of the latest insults to George, sign up for OL Daily at downs.ca. It's a terrific daily uh, newsletter on educational trends. So our goal was something like this. Uh, we wanted, there was a lot of movement with MIT, OpenCourseWare, and so on, where there were some changes happening in terms of how we were relating to content. So we thought, let's make content available for free. And if we have content open, better access to learning. And that's what the OCW essentially argued for. Well, Stephen and I met in Memphis. And uh, we had an opportunity to sit and chat in the hotel lobby. And we said, you know what? We should do to teaching what's been done with content. Like, teaching should be open. Like, why do you just have to get access to content? Why can't you have that whole experience? Because online, the cost of duplication approaches near zero, which alters the economics of teaching and content and everything. So we wanted to move from this model, which had you know, faculty, core curriculum, and content, to a model that looked a little bit like this, where you had peripheral learners. You basically had a messy ecosystem of learning, engagement, passion, the things we care about. And so that was our vision. And uh, we ran probably about half a dozen MOOCs. We, in our case, I mean, I don't know if we had more than 15,000 students in all those MOOCs put together. But, uh, you know, that's sort of what we did. And uh, then you know the rest of the narrative. Um, suddenly MOOCs were a big deal on a number of prominent campuses across the US. Uh, not to be outdone, a number of international groups got involved with MOOCs as well. A whole range of peripheral startups got involved in MOOCs. And so suddenly we have a revolution. And we have Clay Shirky, a Latin term that means everything that's new is an MP3. Um, Use the illustration that higher education was being disrupted. And guess what? You da Napster. That was, uh, Udacity was our Napster. So I love these kinds of things. We really need to hold people who say, 
freaking stupid things accountable in retrospect. Um, and now you see a lot of MOOCs happening. You see a lot of options on a monthly basis. You can take MOOCs wherever you go. We were approaching something in the range of 25 million learners that are taking MOOCs, hundreds of millions. I would approach, we're probably in excess of billions of dollars invested if you include the cost that individual campuses have put into the running of MOOCs. We've put billions of dollars into this experiment. We've had a terrific amount of media exposure. Finally, as educators, we're filled with joy because guess what? We can. People want to talk to us now, right? Like New York Times wants to ask me what I think of MOOCs. And uh, you get on TV programs and you get on conference panels and your main job at a conference panel two years ago was to say something more outrageous than the guy that spoke before you. And so it was just a wonderful time. But then suddenly reality hit for some folks. And that reality was that if you create a view or idea that is disconnected from humanity but driven by technology, in the long run, you're going to hit a wall. If you don't care about research that exists and try and build a field from scratch, whole cloth, you're going to hit a wall. And so, of course, as uh, media being, uh, and a lot of faculty, there's a lot of faculty who sat on the side and were disengaged from some of the activity going on with MOOCs, but they were scared. And I spoke with faculty, you've I'm sure been to conferences where faculty ranted against MOOCs and so on. But when MOOCs were, when Udacity said they had a lousy product, there was a lot of very happy people out there. And a lot of them were academics. See, this stuff is crap. We told you. Why didn't you listen to us? And the narrative went on. And in some research that I did with, uh, with a few doctoral students in Dragon Gasevich, we looked at the prevalence of MOOC-related terms in public media. And we really peaked in the third quarter, 2013. And and since then, we've seen a very steady decline in how public media has started to cover MOOCs. And that's also reflected in the decline within uh, Google uh, searches and so on. So essentially, you know, MOOCs, that beautiful partner on the horizon that was going to fulfill us and complete us, ended up uh, being a shorter term relationship than many of us had intended. And as we started to see the top citations from the top journals, you know, Australian Financial Review, Chronicle of Higher Ed, you've got New York Times, you've got uh, Washington Post. I mean, there were some prominent publications that had an enormous love affair with the idea of MOOCs as a way of challenging what education does. When we started looking at some of the data that actually existed within MOOCs and existed in the reports that people were publishing, we found there was a slightly different narrative um, that we needed to address. Oh, I just got a text from Shane. That was, that was mean. He's Australian, so it's okay. Um, so the, um, the reality of, of uh, MOOCs then was, was that there was actually, it wasn't as disruptive as people said. It was occurring within the existing context of higher education. We had uh, the methodologies wasn't as quantitative as the narrative was. We actually had uh, heavily mixed methodologies in most of the research projects that we looked at. So by way of background, we did the MOOC research initiative. Uh, we had uh, initially, I think, something like 300 submissions. We narrowed it down to 80 that we requested a full submission of, and then we funded about 25 of those. And we did an analysis analysis of the sources and the citations and the language that was used in those, uh, those submissions to come to understand how is, with this very biased data set, how are people and researchers starting to think about MOOCs? And so we found actually they're thinking about it in a pretty academic-y type of way. Uh, the methodologies involved heavy representation from the education faculty, uh, by far the largest field of, of submissions, 106. The next nearest submission was 21 in terms of the field that they represent as a primary domain. And then we went through an agglomerate hierarchical clustering method to sort of look at what did we find from the data. Like what did, uh, looking at the terms and uh, that were frequently used in the, uh, the citations as well as in the documents that we received, we actually just found a series of pretty logical, decent things. We found there was engagement and learner success. Academics cared about this. MOOC design, academics cared about this. Self-regulated and social learning. These were the ways in which computer science educators, soci uh, sociologists, psychologists, and others were thinking about this. Heavy emphasis on networked uh, learning as well, and then a big focus on a motivation, attitude, and success. So in the end, we took a couple of those reports and we produced this. Uh, it's called Preparing for the Digital University. Uh, together with Shane Doss and Dragon Gasevich, we and, and a number of doctoral students, we wanted to look at what do we see in the literature and going forward. Um, we thought it was an OK report, but not everybody did. So uh, uh, just <laughs> take it with a grain of salt. <laughs> I may be biased. 
But, um, and so, and then there's some other reports that came out at around this time, and I'm really trying to argue for is that the hype that we saw in media, academics weren't, sub weren't consumed with it at the same level that the media was. And it was just a moment for hypesters to get into education, drive a narrative, and then step out. And uh, Fiona Holmes did a terrific report on this as well, looking at what's really happening. And this is reports from 2004, but that provided a research-oriented viewpoint of what was going on with MOOCs rather than sort of a hype-driven perspective. And I'll return to this report in a little bit. All right, so that was the MOOC narrative. That's kind of where we are. A lot of our narrative today is that we're going to continue to make learning more accessible. We're going to continue to make it cheaper. And we're not having, I think, yet quite the right narrative. So once I move a little further along on my little rant here today, I'm going to try and cash out some of these ideas in a way that indicates why I think a lot of this is uh, in need of some significant rethinking. Playing with the system. So the higher education system, we know it's coming, it's going, it's, it's being disrupted one day. The next day, disruption theory is, is proven to be completely untested and really just a nice narrative, not a research-oriented view of things. But it's okay, because if you have a foundation in your name, then you can get by with that sort of thing. And so we had, uh, for, for example, certificates. This is by far the fastest growing form of credentialing. Now, if you want to be very clever, you take certificates and you call them nano degrees. And then you can market that stuff. I have no idea which company I'm picking on when I say that. Um, so certificates are a big growing form of uh, credentialing, which reflects a labor market in transition, because you need to go back to the university marketplace to get upgraded and to advance your, your education. We've also seen a lot of interest in competencies and competency-based education as well. Huge interest. And programs, Department of Education, experimental sites, and so on, as well as entire companies or organizations that are transitioning to this space. So it's a terrific time, really, for, for people who are thinking the existing power structures within the education space. But competency-based learning is messy stuff. It takes a lot of rethinking systemically. It's not as quite as quick a rollout as I put a video online and 100,000 people showed up. But it also reflects the fragmentation that happens to information and knowledge in a networked age. That's, I think, the fundamental thing. We really have to consider three critical aspects when we start to meander mentally about what education could look like in the future. First thing we have to recognize is the digital space. You know, digital settings change power relationships. They change who has control and who has access to control. Secondly, the digital space also gives us an enormous opportunity for data and data collection, which is one of the reasons MOOCs have caught the interest of researchers literally across the academic spectrum. And then the third point is when you live in networks, it's a very different experience. You move from control to nudging in network systems, which means essentially you move your mechanisms for control to a more subversive layer where the individual might not at all be aware of how you're being nudged, but you're essentially trying to treat it as a control space to move learners where you want them to go. And so some of the things we've worked on as we've played around with different examples is stuff like this where we're trying to aggregate multiple sources of data, conversations, interaction. This is a course that we ran last year together with Ryan and Carolyn Rose at Carnegie Mellon and Dragon Gasevich. And uh, we wanted to design a MOOC approach. I think actually Justin Dillinger from UTA, uh, from Link Lab, is going to be giving a talk on this uh, tomorrow. And so uh, we really wanted to try and get at the ways in which we could think about spaces as not being owned by us, but being owned by learners. And we sort of had this vision, well, what if you had people who, instead of going, you know, content, lecture, so on, what if you could move them into a network, participate in a network, experience what it's like to form, validate, grow, and challenge knowledge. That's essentially what we tried to do. Most learners hated it, but we still did it. And we'll do it again, but maybe a little better. And so, but the, the research at this point is now starting to catch up a little bit because now you have uh, edX and Coursera that have a terrific amount of data set and you've got some wickedly bright researchers working on these problems. And we're starting to see that these MOOCs are actually quite nuanced. They're addressing a different audience than we thought they would. They're no longer disrupting the university system. Instead, they're most likely going to be subsumed into and become a part of the university system. And that's reflected with edX, for example, the partnership with ASU. Uh, there's a recent one with Texas that was announced on something similar, this idea of getting the first year access through MOOCs. Uh, we've also seen, in combination with those trajectories, this granularization of assessment, that we're starting to think differently about what does it mean to be competent, can we work with badges and alternative credentialing formats as indicators of an individual's competence, rather than just a single degree that is far too big, and you know, instead of a scalpel, you're trying to solve a problem with a sledgehammer. So then we look briefly at the uh, 
the higher education system, it looks something like this. It's an integrated system with multiple players that are doing multiple things. And so you have the research, the administration, the curriculum going on. Uh, we've got the funding structures, but we have some soft elements, the legacy connections to other systems, the reputation, trust, and relevance of the system. So this is basically an image of what higher education looks like as a complete system. What's interesting today is we're moving from an integrated system to something that looks more like an ecosystem. So this entire model is being rapidly unbundled through startups and through new companies coming online that uh, want to serve a sector of that. So if you want to move online rapidly but you're not feeling comfortable doing it, then you'll have the opportunity to hire that capability by working with a provider in that space. So this process of being unbundled really just leads to the next stage, which is rebundling. And that's where we're starting to enter into. Once you pull the pieces apart, you have to reconnect them. And when you reconnect them, you create new power structures. So revolutionaries conserve once they've had their revolution. And we're just at the point of still trying to pick the system apart a little bit. We're starting to see government response that, yeah, we should pick this apart a bit. We're seeing uh, the influence of alternative credentialing, alternative pathways into the labor market outside the university sector, growing amount of corporate providers in this space, boot camps and so on. So we're at that point now where we're going to, in the next five years, start restitching a new university model or a new model of higher education. So let's just leave it there. But let's talk change a little bit. And I'm going to take a slight meander for about three slides, and then I'll return to things that I actually care about. So change is a really complicated thing. It certainly isn't linear, but change is fundamentally a process of power rearchitecting. And so if you look at the models of change that have traditionally been used by, uh, or at least advocated for, whether it's creative destruction, Joseph Schumpeter, uh, which essentially informs the disruptive theory of uh, Christensen. But you have a few models that I find a little more appealing. There's three in particular, and one that I favor above the others, which I'll get into a little bit. So there's the idea of a paradigm shift. So Thomas Kuhn's Scientific Revolutions. But Brian Arthur's also addressed this in his text, where he looks at the role that technology plays in our lives. We have the long cycle of adoption. This is an important one that we're just starting to see the benefits of this in higher education. So Paul A. David did a paper where he looked at the electrification of America. And that was how long did it take from the time that electricity was made available until the time it made a systemic impact? It's about a 40-year cycle. Early on, what we did was we would take the, the coal or whatever engine we had in the basement of a plant. We would replace it with an electrical engine, but nothing would change on the floors. We'd still have the same shaft running across multiple floors if that went down the whole building went down, if one of the shafts went down or, or the, the belts coming off the central shaft on a floor went down, we lost that entire uh, floor's capability. Once we start to understand electricity, because it's networked, changes things. We don't need that central power hub. We can make assembly line models. Henry Ford and others bring this out, and suddenly we can have localized power, localized influence, and it changed an awful lot of stuff. The one that I'm quite interested in, though, is Carlotta Perez's work on technical, technical socio, and economic transitions, uh, which we, I think are, the era we're in today is a terrific illustration of her concepts, where there haven't been many, but there have been punctuated periods of dramatic change, roughly every couple hundred years, where society goes through a cycle like this. And it's driven by technological advancement, societal upheaval, and economic transitions. So a number of examples of what this looks like. Um, I mean, you can just read the slide. What I'm most interested, though, is what does it do to power? How does the climate that we're in, where we're seeing a re-architecture of the higher education system, how does that impact power? And how does that impact who has power? Who can make power? Who can influence others who don't have power? And that's a topic or a conversation that I don't think we're having, but we should have, because we're, that's precisely what's happening. The undercurrent of these connections and reconnections of systems is essentially one of a new structure being created that likely will govern education for a long time to come. What I want to talk about now is the things that I actually care about. So those of you that are doing your email, you may want to listen. But um, I'm interested now in trying to get past a research-oriented view of what this stuff means. You know, rather than just basic research that doesn't have an impact or just an innovation that isn't research oriented, which is what the prominent MOOCs initially were, the research is being backfilled, I'd like us to start thinking at this idea of Pasteur's Quadrant, which is a model that we use in Link Lab, where we want our research to be informative, the advancement of basic knowledge, but we also want it to have an impact, change people's lives and influence people.
So here's my discussion now, and I'm going to get a little weird on you in a bit, so I'll apologize for that. But um, So my argument, I guess, is that right now we have a narrative of MOOCs as primarily addressing changing work and changing employment. It's a good narrative. I mean, all of us like to be employed, we like to eat, we like, you know, these are things that we enjoy. But um, I think we're missing really the bigger opportunity that exists here. In many cases, our goals for MOOCs are quite stunted. We have a narrow vision of what MOOCs are and what they do. Uh, back to uh, Fiona Holland's report, uh, this was the early response from individuals that looked at why are you, what are your institutional goals for developing and running a MOOC? And their goals fit into, we want to do research, we want to maintain brand, we want to look at economics, we want to do outcomes, innovation, those kinds of things. Anyone see something missing in this diagram for educational goals? Yeah, I'm very interested now. I mean, these are nice things. But I'm very interested in MOOCs doing something else for us. And like I said, I'm going to take a slight detour. And later on, we're going to hold hands. We're going to smoke a peace pipe. And we're going to sing songs. And uh, that'll be it. So I want MOOCs to make us a better people, right? Kinder, more compassionate, more humane as individuals, but also as a society. I don't think we can transition to becoming a better society by only developing the cognitive dimensions of an individual. Even though that's primarily been what we've been doing with MOOCs. We've said, you take a MOOC, you get smarter, you get a better job, yay you. There's a Coursera report that was recently published that actually indicated that while individuals felt they were doing quite well by taking MOOCs, their actual tangible career outcomes uh, were sitting, I think, between 17 and 18 percent of individuals stated that they had had a tangible career impact. Now that likely was too short a cycle to look at. Sometimes developing new skills takes a while to work through the system. So a few projects I'd like to uh, just briefly reference that, uh, that I'm interested in now or involved in at least uh, try to address this and I'll return to the concept in just a minute uh, about um, what I'd like to see happen with MOOCs at the next level. And, and then I'll return again to my rant about what MOOCs don't do. So first of all, there's a few things in Link Lab. Uh, the idea of mindfulness. Um, it's a topic or an area of interest that I think we need to pay more attention to as we start to consider the affective and the emotional development of individuals. I mean, quite possibly, if we advance as a society, there's a real possibility, if you listen to your Elon Musks and your Bill Gates and your Stephen Hawking's that say computers, and even now there's numerous indications of computers advancing cognitively well beyond human capacity for medical diagnosis and so on. So this starts to look at, well, what is it going to be for us? What's our future going to be in this kind of a context? What are we going to be as, as humanity when we have technology systems that far outpace ourselves, cognitively at least? And I think we, the prospect, I hope, is that we enter a new stage of creativity, a new stage of humanity, and a new stage of compassion because we aren't concerned with some of those. The computers will do all the hard thinking and we'll become just better human beings and creating a more civil and more organized society. So that's my utopian view of what the outcome of that is. Another project we're involved in with InSpark, uh, we're working with ASU and Smart Sparrow, uh, where we're looking at trying to get hundreds of thousands of students at an undergrad level to advance through an integrated, problem-based oriented approach to solving challenges. So instead of saying, today you will learn biology, and then you'll learn chemistry, and then you'll learn geology, we're saying, is there life out there? And this builds on some work that Ariel Anbar and others have done in the past with the Hab Worlds project. So it's big questions that require you to think integratively across multiple domains in order for you to be able to answer it. And then some of the work we've more recently done, Ryan mentioned we did a keynote together at the uh, Edme, nope, what was that? EDM conference in Madrid. And so we're looking at the idea of can you develop better personal learning graphs, much like a knowledge graph structure, let's say in Google or Garfield's journal impact factor, addresses interconnected knowledge. Now, back to ranting. So what types of problems do we want MOOCs to solve? Well, if you listen to the narrative today, we want MOOCs to do things like this. We want them to open doors, better careers, MOOCs are going to give you your dream job, and so on. And I want to emphasize these are very important things. You know, we, you know, the, kind of helps to be working to move up different striations within a society. Now I'm going to get sad. So society is essentially, at some levels, pretty fucked up. And so that's reflected in a number of things that I don't think we're paying enough attention to from an educational lens. And things like this happen again and again and again and again. And things like this happen again. And things like this happen again. So a narrative that I would like to advance to you as researchers is while you think 
about the work that you're doing. And while you think about the kinds of research approaches that you're taking with your MOOCs, are you advancing beyond the cognitive? Are you advancing to the whole person? Are you advancing to something that isn't narrowly focused on just making someone smarter or getting a better job? As a colleague recently put it, um, you know, perhaps when we're trying to educate the brain, we should also consider reaching for the heart. And I think that's a critical narrative that's consuming more and more of my time. It's a viewpoint and a perspective that I think has been missing in some of our educational research as we've transitioned to MOOCs. Certainly, the thinking of Dewey and others, which is going to be well familiar with anybody in Teachers College, has has driven that motivation of a better society and a better world. And so what I'd like to put forward then as sort of my concluding slide and an invitation is, and I don't know where I'm going with this, quite honestly. So what I'm trying to say is come talk to me. Send me an email. If some of the things I talked about resonate with you and if you want to start thinking about what is a kinder, more gentle, more compassionate society look like and how can the research that we're engaged with, MOOCs and other things, stop by, give me a card, chat with me or whatever. But I guess that's the question I'd like to focus on uh, and, and the challenge I'd like to leave with you as you're sharing your excellent research over the next few days. As you connect with one another and take your brilliant insights and share them with others, think about the human dimension. Think about does the work that you're doing and starting to do, can you move, yes, still prepare your learners for employment, but can you raise that a level or two? Can you raise it to something that helps us to challenge these intractable, complex, difficult questions that we face? And start to look at what that might mean. And so can we become a better society? Can we become a more compassionate society? And can the process, can we become a kinder or more gentle learner? So as I mentioned, please stop by, say hi. And I guess at that point, I'll pause for questions.